All right, welcome to this week of Inside Aviation. We've got plenty to talk about this week. A lot of aviation news out there, um, but we also have two special guests that are joining us this week. We've got Ian Hoyt, Director of Marketplace at AircraftForSale.com. And then later this episode, we're going to have David Nealman, who some would call a serial airline founder. Um, he's the founder of uh, JetBlue, uh, partial founder of Azul, and now uh, founded Breeze Airways. And this is the founder and uh, CEO. Uh, so I we're lobbying him that. for more Denver routes, which we'll see yeah. how that works. Yeah, you'll see how that works out for you. Yeah, but you know, outside of the two guests, this week has been pretty intense for for Boeing and Airbus. Nobody's talking about that. No. Can you give us a quick <laughs> recap of like what's going on with Boeing? And Man, like, well, you know, I don't think it's bad it's luck or if it's you know, yeah, yeah, you know, it's hard to um, sit here and speculate on incidents that that haven't been investigated, um, you know, by some of the best investigative agencies, whether it be the NTSB or, or another in the world. Um, but, you know, there's been a lot of news this week. That's the bottom line. Uh, there's been a lot of incidents that have taken place and they have certainly caught the eyes of the public. Um, you know, last week we had uh, a tire or wheel, I guess, fall off a 777 departing San Francisco that was caught live on video. Um, <laughs> We had a, another United 737 MAX 8 roll off the end of the runway. It kind of Tokyo drifted it uh, in Houston. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a uh, earlier this week. We're recording, by the way, on March 13th. So take that in mind as we talk through these incidents. Um, but earlier this week, we had a United 777 rolling out of Sydney. That's some hydraulic fluid, which some thought was fuel. Definitely is not fuel. Uh, hydraulic fluid coming out of the main landing gear. So... You know, it's been a nonstop week, um, especially for United uh, and especially for Boeing. Um, and then, you know, I think it's very easy for um, a quote unquote lay person who may not be uh, an aviation insider to sit here and say, well, these are all connected or, um, you know, these are, there's some kind of issue going on. You know, I've seen so much out on Twitter or X or whatever. Uh, about all these and how they might be linked. But, you know, the reality of the situation is that there's zero evidence to suggest that any of these are linked. Um, you know, there was that another incident I forgot to mention is that there was a United 737-900, uh, you know, over 20-year-old airplane, well, you know, developed well before the MAX and well before any of this uh, stuff started taking place with the MAX, uh, coming out of Houston, ingested bubble wrap um, and, uh, you know, had a sort of an engine failure type of situation. Um, looked pretty bad on the video. Aircraft returned uh, safely. So, um, but you know, I sit here and I watch a lot of these, seen many over the years, and um, you know, I I don't think any of them are connected at all. And I think aviation, commercial aviation, still remains the safest way to travel by far. Um, and I think we, you know, we should continue uh, as an industry to prioritize safety over everything else. Um, so you know who I want know. to interview? The guy who had to file the insurance claim for his car for a triple seven yeah, wheel for the triple seven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, it was like a Tesla too. I mean, it was a nice car. Yeah, I mean, I'm glad nobody was in it, but it's, it must be like so heartbreaking coming home and then just seeing your plane. I, mean, I don't know what lot. I don't know what lot that was, man. But can you imagine just like getting off your flight <laughs> from from wherever and rolling up tired as hell and and then seeing your car just absolutely <laughs> just smash uh and you know, those tires those wheels weigh 265 pounds uh you know that's Dude, they're huge <laughs> like no you matter stand where, next to them they're like pretty oh for yeah, sure i mean no high. matter where they're falling from um you know that's it's gonna hurt <laughs> it's gonna hurt yeah so, uh, um so yeah i guess yeah a couple things you didn't mention are the 787 incident that's still like under oh, investigation which uh who knows what that was it really just seems like turbulence but they're saying it was a mechanical issue so i'm interested to hear more about that but uh before the show we were talking about a couple airbus incidents that have happened this week that nobody has talked about and i think it's just because it's not the hot topic right now it's not the narrative and, right from the mainstream yeah media. what was the one you were mentioning it was like uh reject oh, the takeoff yeah. in 110 what? knots so yeah you know just like many of us uh aviation folks you know i Every couple of weeks, we'll go through Av Herald, which if you haven't been, it's a great website. A lot of good data and insights on air safety stuff. And yesterday, uh, March 12th, 
Uh, there's an American A321 Neo rolling out of Phoenix. Uh, rejected takeoff fairly high speed. Um, I think it was it was well over 100 knots, um, you know, and uh, didn't really see a whole lot about that on the news. So, uh, again, you know, you have to kind of separate narrative from reality. And, um, you know, I, I personally think that a lot of this, you know, trying to produce the narrative that, you know, a 20 plus year old 737 900 having that issue is somehow linked to Boeing's current problems actually distracts from the kind of um, deep running, deep rooting issues within the Boeing enterprise uh, that are taking place right now. And, um, you know, so I, I, it, it kind of pains me to see some of this uh, going on because, um, you know, we, we really should be focusing on, on dealing with the issues at hand at Boeing. And um, I think this kind of takes away from it. No, I agree. Um, and I think we can say that next week we'll have a whole episode focused on what's going on at Boeing, what could be related to what's going on, what isn't related, and it's just bad luck, um, and how that's all working out. But uh, yeah, I guess we'll, we'll jump to our first guest here, which is Ian Hoy. He's the director of Marketplace at Firecrown, so that looks over aircraftforsale.com. Ian's been a general aviation pilot for, I think, 10 years now. He has experience in other marketplaces like RV Share and a few others he's worked at in the past. And he's got he's worked in the industry of marketing as well. So his insights in how all that relates to how the marketplace is changing the industry right now, is changing that whole like listing and buying and inspecting and you know, that whole mess of buying an aircraft is super interesting. So uh, we'll go kick it off to us and Ian. Ian Hoyt, welcome to Inside Aviation. So you're the director of Marketplace at Firecrown, specifically aircraftforsale.com. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do and what aircraftforsale.com is? Yeah. First of all, thanks for having me, Ryan and Kevin. Um, so aircraft for sale and, and kind of what I do at Air, aircraft for sale is I lead kind of the, the roadmap for, um, you know, what is coming out on the platform, uh, as it relates to, uh, bringing transparency to the aircraft marketplace. So aircraft for sale, uh, dot com in its current state or in its kind of reinvigoration was, uh, launched, uh, around this time last year. Uh, and I joined on a couple months later. Um, and since then we've been really focused on how can we bring new features to an aircraft marketplace that hasn't really been seen before. Um, so I, I think we'll get into a little bit more about what those exactly are probably in a little bit. Um, uh, but our whole ethos is really focused around like, you know, looking for an airplane has been really antiquated for the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years. Uh, you're typically used to posting a listing on a site um, that isn't really mobile friendly or isn't friendly to a user to really glean the right information that they need to make an informed buying decision. And then you're left with a bag of like, okay, what do I do next? And so it's like, I think there's a better way that we can go about this where uh, you can get all the information you need ahead of time as you're doing your due diligence, as you're looking for airplanes. And then you can feel more informed as you're going in that next stage of kind of whittling down what airplanes you might want um, to, you know, make, take that next step with a seller or to look into more or maybe go do a pre-buy. And so that's kind of our whole goal with aircraft for sale is step by step release features and opportunities for us to help bring that transparency and education to the buying process. Cool. So what would you say to somebody who's used to using one of your competitors like Barnstormers, Trade a Plane, um, so like controller? So what would you say to them, like why they should list and search with aircraftforsale.com? Yeah, that's a fair question. So, uh, you know, obviously I'm biased because, uh, you know, aircraft for sale is kind of uh, our baby right now. But, you know, I think it goes back to that transparency. Uh, when you know, and sorry, you were asking about a seller, right? Not a, a yeah, buyer yeah, like a, like a yeah. seller for right now. Yeah. So I think like on the seller side, uh, it's a little bit different of a story than a, the buyer, right? You're 
you know, if you're coming to aircraft for sale, you're going to get the audience of flying magazine and all the different assets, um, that, you know, we now own, um, and we can get those listings in front of those, um, users and customers and subscribers. So that's really powerful because, you know, we focus really on building a brand that people trust and we want to build a marketplace that people trust. And so that seamless transition between, uh, the way we can communicate that your listing is available to the way that people can read your listing and look at your listing. Um, those are both, uh, new ways of doing it. And so that's the real benefit as a seller, uh, listing on the platform is not only do you get the audience, but of course you also get, uh, added insights. You can see, you know, exactly how many views your listing is getting, how many people are saving. Uh, and we are also breaking down those barriers for people to reach out and, and make it just really easy and secure. So, um, you know, that the leads coming in are more qualified because they've already looked at all the information on the, on the listing page, for example, before they've reached out. So those are some of the benefits as a seller, um, is just that audience and also that granularity with the listing that allows you to get more qualified leads. Yeah, I think a lot of people, what they don't know is we'll highlight a lot of these listings for free in articles, you know? Yeah. If, if yep. you go to flyingmagazine.com, there's like a whole aircraft for sale section where it's just like cool airplanes we want to write about and they're on there. So that is like a, just like an automatic bonus. So, you know, just me, I'm probably biased, but I think like the UI on aircraft for sale is better than most of the aircraft marketplaces. So outside of just the UI being good, can you talk a little bit about like plane price? It's in beta right now and how that's how, what feedback you've been seeing there, how it's been working. Have you sold any aircraft by them using plane price? Oh yeah. Uh, so I think I want to just go back to the user experience and, uh, you know, user interface point. Like I think that is really important because going back to kind of the way that it's been done for the last 30 years has been no innovation on kind of the user experience side of things. I think it's kind of an afterthought. Um, and it's, it's no diss on maybe the, you know, the print influence of the world where it's just kind of a different uh, way of thinking. Um, but it hasn't really spilled over into the digital side of the marketplace efforts and they both matter, um, a lot. And so, you know, coming in, that was a huge focus. It's like, you need to create a marketplace that is there are no friction points to allow them to get where they need to go. And so we're constantly thinking about that and also asking users, you know, how they feel and iterating from there to make sure they get to the places they need to go and the things they're searching for as quick as possible. That comes down to also making the search experience the best out there. And we do that by fine tuning the search algorithm to get the results that you're looking for higher up in the results so that you're not spending as much time going through, you know, hundreds of listings. Um, we want to serve you better and get you, um, to your ultimate goal faster. So that's on the kind of user experience side of things on the feature side of things, like you mentioned, um, at the beginning of the year, we launched uh, plane price beta. And so for anyone that doesn't know what plane price beta is, it's our AI driven valuation model for aircraft. And what we're able to do is use user generated data sets and public data sets, combine that and make informed decisions on where we think or where plane price rather thinks, um, the value and the list price of that aircraft would be, or should be based off of all of that data. And so it's super powerful for uh, people in the buying mindset to compare, of course, asking to our plane price and see what the delta is. You know, sometimes it's above. So sometimes people are listing it for more than our plane price. Sometimes people are listing it for less than our plane price. It's similar to, um, you know, some other models out there in different spaces. Uh, you can also think of, you know, Zillow and their Zestimate. There's a lot of similarities there um, on, on kind of the approach. Uh, but it's, it's met as kind of like a litmus test to see where they're at. And, and that accuracy, um, is, is on par with some of the markets in comparison to say like Zestimates, you know, uh, Zillow's Zestimate. So we know we're on track, uh, from an accuracy standpoint, um, as it relates to 
our model serving you a number that you can rely on. So we've seen uh, a lot of like positive feedback about plain price. It's the first time anyone's uh, offered a publicly available valuation tool. It's always been kind of um, masked behind a paywall um, or you make it really hard for people to figure out uh, what it is. And we just think it, it makes sense to give you know some of that data to people up front when they're looking for aircraft. So Ian, what do you you know, what do you say to people that still, that I know there's some out there still use kind of print listings. Uh, does aircraft for sale have anything, uh, for people who might want to still use a monthly print listing? Yeah, I think, uh, I think Kevin has one right there. Yeah, it's right here, dude. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's almost so like we time that. Our print team does a fantastic job. I mean, the amount of you know work that goes into getting that out um, in the hands of all of our subscribers uh, is not beyond me. I'm a I'm a digital guy. I have to admit. So um, you know, learning the print side of um, of the house, uh, you know, in the time I've been here has been amazing. Uh, but it's it's so awesome to see that come in the mail because you can see the listings. You and and you can kind of just peruse them at your leisure. Uh, you know, in different parts of the home, if you will. So, uh, but yeah, the new publication or there's a new design, a new layout, and it's looking great. Um, so, you know, that's that's there for people that love the print side of things. It's really easy to get from a print listing into uh, aircraftforsale.com. Uh, there's QR codes on the print publication, so you can just scan it and get on our mobile friendly um, marketplace if you wish and get more details that way. Do you sort of find still that uh, the majority of the viewership, uh, the leads that you guys are getting are through print or is it mostly mostly digital? You know, it's I think it's split. I think, um, you know, we're seeing uh, an emerging amount of people using digital just because uh, we're also seeing an emerging amount, you know, of the younger generation looking to acquire uh, you know, their first aircraft, maybe their first affordable aircraft to start training in. So we definitely see that emerging. Uh, but we, of course, have a very healthy amount coming uh, directly to us from our, our print publications as well. So, uh, you know, it's it's very much split uh, currently. Gotcha. Yeah. I mean, you know, last week on this show, we, we talked with Preston Holland, who's also uh, within kind of our fire crown group. But, um, you know, he he was talking about, you know, the digital application process and, uh, and, and the tools that they use on the finance side, um, that are pretty much going digital. Do you see the future of, of aircraft transactions being done completely digitally? I mean, you know, you can do that with a car these days. You can buy a car on Amazon. Yeah, I think, um, you know, I'm, again, I'm biased cause I think, uh, I think it should, uh, you know, my, my big kind of hairy audacious goal is if we could make aircraft buying as simple as a click of a button that is the north star right and you know we're not there yet we're very far from that but we're making steps to get closer and closer to that there's always going to be in-person elements you're not going to buy likely an airplane without going to see it or getting you know a proper inspection done however a lot of those different elements of the aircraft buying experience can be made more seamless with the advent of technology. And we just haven't seen that. And sometimes I do feel like we're talking in like this, this weird world um, where I'm saying the word technology because it just hasn't happened yet, um, but it's 2024 and at least it's happening now. Yeah, I think when we first started, Ian, we joked around putting an airplane on Afterpay, just like clicking yeah. on it and being yeah. able to like <laughs> shop yeah. pay an airplane, which and would be interesting. I mean, you know, it's no secret. I'm probably of a younger generation. And so, you know, I, I look for ways to make it that seamless. Um, and that's just what I've grown up with, you know, uh, having those opportunities to, to make those purchases in a seamless manner with the admin of, you know, the second wave of e-commerce and really e-commerce getting its footing, the Carvanas of the world, you know, all these things, um, you know, people were like, this can't be done. You can't buy something on the internet or you can't buy a car on the internet. Um, people are saying that right now about aircraft. And, uh, I think that's our opportunity to, to show that you can. 
So yeah, not to circle back to features, but to circle back to features. There yeah. is a new one you have out that's the TBO gauge. Is yeah. there anything else you're going to be releasing, you know, in terms of maintenance or uh, aircraft time, flight history, anything like that you can talk about? Yeah. So um, I'm glad you brought up the TBO gauge. It's actually one of my favorite new features and it's uh, still getting rolled out. Uh, we want to make sure it's, you know, accurate, as accurate as possible for all the different type, you know, the thousands of make and model aircraft out there. Um, but so the TBO gauge, just for background, you know, when you're looking at an aircraft, you're looking at a lot of things. One of those is of course, how many hours has been on the engine. And that guides a lot of valuation because if you're next to the TBO or the time before overhaul, there's a good chance that you're going to need an engine overhaul. Uh, and that can be very, very expensive. And so that impacts valuation, that impacts how you could get lend, like lending, uh, you know, all of these different things. And so giving people the ability to quickly see, okay, this, this aircraft's amount of hours on the engine compared to the factory recommended TBO is a really great way to see, okay, maybe I don't want to, you know, approach this deal because it's next to TBO and I'm going to need to get lending or the flip side. Maybe I do want an aircraft that is, you know, close to TBO because I want to get a, you know, a fresh new engine or I want a project or, you know, so many different reasons. I can't really predict what, why people would want one or the other, uh, but it's impossible for you to know, have an index of say, you know, thousands of different TBOs for different engines and, and aircraft types. And so we were able to harness data to visualize that really easily so you can go on a listing and right now it's on single engine pistons um, we'll be expanding that and multi-engine pistons we'll be expanding that more in the future uh, but you can see relative to how many engine hours are left versus the tbo for that related engine so that's really exciting i hope you go check it out let me know what you think um, but yeah we're coming out with other features all the time basically our sentiment is every part of a listing page, how can we just make that more visually appealing and more informative at a glance? So, you know, without getting into the weeds, yes, maintenance is definitely a, a target of ours. You know, how can we interpret, you know, log books and, you know, maintenance files and um, the history of an airplane's maintenance history uh, in a easier way for the potential buyer? That's, that's a huge focus for us. Um, that kind of goes back to, we also launched, uh, NTSB and, you know, accident and incident history. And so if there's accident or incident history on an aircraft, you will see it populate on the listing, which allows you to just get a glance and get context as to what they're saying in the damage area of their listing, or if they're not putting anything at all, you can cross-reference that and just start to get a better ecosystem of what this airplane is about. It's not meant to serve, of course, as the final be all. You need to have a conversation with the seller, uh, but it's a really good place to see, okay, this had a gear up landing or, you know, this incident is actually not really a big deal. And, um, you know, maybe it's, you know, not a deal breaker for you. So out of curiosity, have these new features inc increased the session times? Cause like for me, it's a time suck. Just being out yeah. there, checking out the price, like plane price, checking out TBO time, all that. Yeah, it's certainly increased, um, you know, time on site and also, you know, paid views, um, you know, per session. It's, it's been crazy, uh, which, you know, was the big frou-frou hypothesis at the beginning. It was like, oh, and, you know, we're going to launch all these features and it's going to be so sticky. People are not want to go, want to go anywhere else. And now we're living in the time where that's starting to prove true, which is uh, really exciting. Yeah, I know it's, and then if that's not enough, there's also just like articles related to that airframe at the bottom, yeah. which is yeah. kind of what we were so, talking about at the beginning. That's the beautiful thing about being a marketplace. That's also uh, a part of, you know, flying, uh, media and all the different awesome assets is, is the fact that we can you know, pull in that data to not only inform the listings, but also to granularize and give context. So like you said, every listing has, um, 
you know, flying content or plane and pilot content or, you know, aviation consumer, all of these awesome outlets, uh, you, you can see populated articles related to that listing and that make and model of airplane. So you can go learn more about it and, and understand if this is maybe the right airplane for your mission. Yeah. So it's doing the research for you in a way. Yeah. So along the journey, if I'm looking for an aircraft on here, is there financing options? Is there, you know, partners you send people to or anything like that? Any other services that I would need yeah. to buy a plane? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, like I said, we're actively working on making sure that, you know, every part of the, the buying experience is, uh, seamless and there's an option for you, um, so that you, you can stay in one place and not have to hop around and try to learn how to buy an airplane. Um, right now, the number, you know, the biggest priority is of course, finance. Uh, so, you know, flying finance, uh, Preston over there and his team, uh, do a really great job in getting people qualified at all different levels, um, for, you know, whatever they're looking for, whether it's, you know, a hundred thousand dollar 172 or, you know, uh, a, a Cirrus, you know, an SR 22. So, I, you know, flying finance is of course, kind of the, the partnership, uh, you know, sister company. Uh, and so I would highly suggest, you know, checking out flyingfinance.com um, if you're looking to potentially buy in the next, you know, few months to a year. So what kind of aircraft can you, I mean, I know obviously GA um, fixed wing aircraft are probably your biggest market out there on, on the marketplace, but what else, what else can uh, be listed or has been listed? Yeah. So, uh, you know, aircraft are of course, uh, the, the biggest focus and, and the most popular on the platform. Uh, so we were nearing, you know, a thousand active aircraft available, which is, uh, quite a selection for someone in the market. Uh, but we are also launching real estate. Um, don't know when this podcast will come out, but there's a good chance that, um, real estate will be launched by the time that you are listening to this, which is really exciting. So, there will be aviation real estate listings. So if you're looking to kind of take your hobby to the next level and you want to find somewhere, uh, you know, in the world where you can have a hangar home or be on a private strip, you can go to aircraft for sale and find something that works for you. So real estate will be coming soon and there will be, you know, other, uh, other fun things coming as well that I don't want to talk to cause I don't want to over promise. <laughs> yeah. Well, if I, if I, let's just put it this, let's give you a hypothetical here because we know that I, I really like my hypotheticals on this show. Yeah. If I were to go and somehow, uh, you know, kind of get a 737 that, uh, got off of a lease, you know, got it cheap, but I wanted to resell it yeah. in the marketplace. Can I do that? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, All there's right. absolutely no reason why you couldn't, um, you know, we've seen, we've seen, I think we've had one or two 737s, I believe on the platform. Um, you know, obviously they don't sell as quick, uh, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, we've seen some really interesting aircraft, you know, anywhere from those, you know, larger, you know, commercial style aircraft, uh, down to, you know, projects, um, you know, experimental projects, uh, you know, we get a handful of those as well. So everything in between, I would say, of course, aircraft for sale, uh, you know, has a majority of single engine, uh, piston listings. Uh, it's very popular for that space, but we also have a ton of jets, uh, you know, in turbo. They have some helicopters on there too, right? And helicopters. Yep. Yeah. They're pretty sweet. So what's been yeah. your favorite listing that you've seen on there since, you know, you got first dibs on all of them. Oh man. It's gotta be the seven, seven, right? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, there's there was a, a 150 a, that I was obsessed with for a while. That was I don't there. know if this was my favorite listing. It was the most it was an interesting listing. Kevin, you'll you'll probably remember this one, but the DC three with oh yeah, uh, the, the oh, yeah. turbine outfitted um uh, uh engines. So you know that was really interesting. It it's definitely not um an affordable option, but it's uh it was a really cool, you know, DC three outfitted with turbine uh power so um if you're in the is market is it off the market is i don't know i haven't looked there? in a while to see last time i checked it was on here still but ryan do you know the actual price for that? i want to say it was like eight million or i think something. it was over it was like over yeah. a couple million right yeah 
Yeah. Yeah. I think we, we were all guessing okay. it was going to be like 1.2 to two and it was eight. So yeah, we had a, we had, yeah, kind of a bet going in the office and none of us were right by a factor of like five to 10. Yeah. So it was, it was kind of hilarious. So, yeah. so, you know, I'm going to give you, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a trigger word here Uh-oh. and it's going to be a trigger phrase call for price. Oh boy. You have triggered me. <laughs> Everywhere on my social media, like my head headers are like call for price with a with a line slash through it. Um, sorry, go what ahead. What don't you like about it? Tell, yeah, what's your I, peeve? yeah. I mean, everyone has that thing in in their industry, I guess. But like call for price for me as a marketer by trade uh, really just irks me because it's just annoying. It's like, there's, there's a better way to do this. Um, and, and I think like the industry, and this is a perfect example of the industry in years past, you know, in decades past is someone did it and then everyone kept doing it instead of experimenting and trying other things. And when you have data su- to suggest that call for price is not the best call to action there is, uh, which we do, uh, then maybe it's time to change and maybe it's time to add transparency to kind of the the whole ecosystem because my theory is if you put an asking price on your listing you are qualifying your buyers better than not putting one at all and sure the theory for broker the broker side is well i want to get a call so then i can sell them on another airplane i get it but if we're If we're all in the boat of we want to serve the buyers best and and it's in their best interest, then let's add a price to start that conversation and go from there. You know, I would be I'd be happier to see maybe a a price that skews a little bit higher than no price at all. I obviously don't want to see either of those. I just want realistic prices and a fair market. But, you know, I think we, you know, the dynamics of the the buy and sell side will even that out. So call for price is triggering for me in a perfect world. Um, I would love all listings to have a price right now. Our search, um, our search algorithm demotes call for price listings. We do allow it, but, um, if you put call for price, you will be at the bottom of the results. Will a call for price listing have a plain price estimate on it? Most, uh, typically. So, if you put call for price, um, it will still show a plain price um, price, and then also the the range. Um, so you can start to get that sentiment. So it it really doesn't help a seller to not put a price um, unless, of course, they see a plain price and it's potentially tails above what they were going to list. I don't know, but it's too early to tell on that front. As a consumer, I love that. Yeah. So I, we can cut this out if, if you don't want to talk about it. But the the number one inquiry for call for price listings, isn't it what's the price? Yeah, yeah. That or is it still available just like Facebook Marketplace? But, <laughs> um, you know, and that's the funny thing is that's like that is the pinna- that is the perfect example of like why we're doing what we're doing is, yes, you can do it that way. But why not just take the extra step out of the equation? Maybe you might have less leads, but maybe you will have more qualified leads, you know, and like, what do you want? You know, if I don't want brokers to be um, hung, like my goal is to give brokers more qualified leads and sellers more qualified leads, not just give them less leads that that doesn't make any sense. So like I want to we want to lift the industry in total and get more qualified people into the hands of professionals and sellers. Um, but we don't do that by bait and switching them. We do that by educating them and getting the right people to the right airplanes. A few years ago, I was in the market for a 150 and I never contacted a call for price listing. Like I yeah. didn't even like, I was like, I'm not, I don't even care. Like, yeah, I, I need a wild price. So yep, totally. Yeah. It's, has it's, that, and neither have I, for, I mean, I've never yeah. reached out to them. A call for price. Has plain price decreased the amount of call for price listings, or is that just like me making stuff up by looking through listings? Uh, that's a good question. I actually haven't run that specific uh, comparison. Now I want to. Um, you know, I think holistically, I think I do see definitely more prices being added. 
uh, I do, I have seen a lot of call for prices update with a price um, as of the last couple months. So that would suggest that yes, that is the case. Um, but you know, I'd have to look exactly to see if that's the case. But um, I, I do think there's pressure. I, you know, it's funny when we launched Plain Price, we thought maybe brokers would be um, really frustrated with it, right? You know, and there's sellers and brokers, and they all kind of you know individual sellers and brokers. Um, you know, we of course want to cater to anyone looking to try to offload an airplane. Um, but kind of the sentiments been the opposite, right? So plain price actually adds validity to an asking price, especially if um, the difference is you know negligible, which it typically is. You know, we we see a lot of fair uh, priced valuations, uh, fair, good, and great. Uh, we don't see you know a ton of overpriced, which is the way we rate uh, like an overpriced listing or high listings, which is just above fair price, if that makes sense. Um, we see high, but we just, we see a lot of fair deals. And that's the point of plain price is we want to see the, the totality of listings fall in that fair, ideally good, good valuation area. And, and that's what we're seeing, which is good. So I asked Preston this question before you came into this industry and took over aircraft for sale you know you have your assumptions as a pilot as a you know part owner of a 172 what's yep. something you encountered that you didn't expect to encounter that's a good question um that's a good question i think you know i having been in the industry off and on uh, professionally and as a hobby uh, i'm pretty aware of the resistance to change um, and so, you know, I, I kind of knew what we were getting ourselves into launching some of these transparent features. Uh, I think coming into it, I was worried about, um, not worried, but I thought there would be more resistance from the professional side of the industry into what we're doing just because it hasn't been done. And I think that hasn't been the case. There's, of course, been some resistance. But overall, I think people are really excited in the industry that there are, you know, people like our team kind of bringing data backed transparency into the equation because it makes their job easier over time. I think the hard thing is just bridging the gap between this new thing and how you can use that for uh, to benefit you and your your business and your endeavors. So that's been really encouraging. Uh, so I think that was a positive on kind of what I thought coming into it and what is playing out at the moment. So, uh, really encouraging. Yeah. I mean, just from Twitter and LinkedIn, we saw a ton of positive yeah, and, feedback for playing and price, on the, which was awesome. on the buyer side. It's, it's just, you know, positive feedback all around. So, you know, buyers are loving the features as to be expected. Um, so that's really encouraging, of course. And, you know, a marketplace is successful if you ensure that, you know, the buyers are getting what they want and making it really easy for the sellers um, to to get things in the hands of buyers. Yeah. So, Ian, I had one more question, kind of yeah. bigger picture. What are kind of the market trends you're seeing right now? Are prices dipping from like the COVID high? Are they kind of stagnating? And obviously you don't have like a pulse on the, the entire market, but just what you're seeing on aircraft for sale. What's it like? Yeah, that's, like? that's a good question. I figured you'd ask something like that. Um, but so it's interesting, you know, we, we're, we've been digging into the numbers a, a bit. Um, you know, I, I can, I would prefer to only speak to kind of the single engine world, the single engine piston owner flown space. Uh, and it's kind of, all over the board um, as it relates to actually, uh, you know, of course, the make and model of aircraft and um, actually the kind of bracket of time or age that aircraft is in. So when we look at late model aircraft, so think um, late model, let's just use uh, 172, for example. So you have, say, the 172P model, and this is kind of very tactical, but bear with me here. I think it's like 1980 something is is when that aircraft was out. So we've seen from our data that it suggests that later model 172s, for example, have been appreciating 
um, accounting for like inflation at a at a pretty um, pretty su- substantial rate in the realm of like 13, 14, 15 percent year on year. When you look at like a later model or like a 2000 something model, say a 172 S, um, the story is completely different. So it's like, if I remember, it's like it's been depreciating at a rate of 100 and, or sorry, like 27 percent accounting for inflation. So there's a big delta there between the newer model stuff and the older model stuff, which is to be expected. But at the rate that we're seeing it um, is interesting, to say the least. You see the same thing with um, the Sears models, 20s and, and 22s. Um, so it's just interesting. Uh, I, I can't really talk to like, you know, what's happening, but I can just say that um, older model stuff seems to be holding strong and climbing still where we're seeing the newer stuff um, hold or or fall off just a bit, which, you know, you could just say that's that's obvious or, you know, you can use that as a signal. But um, that's kind of what we're seeing. And then like from a listing standpoint, you know, we we're still seeing a strong uh, marketplace happening uh, with getting new listings every day. Uh, and it, our inquiries are just, you know, through the roof every you know month over month. So, you know, what's happening, you know, I, I think, I think my gut, and this is not data back, but my gut is kind of saying that we're hit it. We've hit kind of this like peak people are, aren't really sure. Um, it was like a crazy Q4 2023 and, you know, we're in this early, you know, Q1 of, um, 2024. And we don't really know, of course, what's happening from a depreciation standpoint and from uh, just uh, the election and just there's a lot of macro impacts happening. I know personally I'm holding off on maybe getting out of my partnership and into my own just to, you know, see see how things happen. And I don't think I'm alone. Um, but yeah, market wise, I think people are kind of like waiting to see right now. If I had like a little uh, ticker at the top of... Uh, aircraft for sale that was like market sentiment kind of like some of the news outlets do on like yeah how, i mean uh, that could be a new feature man yeah so market right. sentiment <laughs> i would be like your new feature it would yeah. say waiting to see you know so <laughs> that's that's kind of where i feel the market is at but yeah yeah no cool man um anything else you want to mention about aircraft for sale ryan you got anything for him no, it's pretty cool no Thanks i think um us. Yeah, I think the only thing I would say is, you know, we are a team of feedback and listening to our customers and users. And so uh, all feedback is welcome to anyone listening. If you are in the market and you're on aircraftforsale.com and you see something you hate or wish you had something that that you want really badly, let us know. Um, We look at all of that and take it into account and and try to build something for you um, for the next, you know, uh, generation of aircraft ownership. Cool, man. And uh, to browse is free. You can create a, an account, right? To create like a list of favorites and, yep. and alerts and stuff like that. Totally listed. Um, just totally free to list as well. So, yep. That's awesome. And to include all the features, right? Plain price, TBO. That's all in there. Yep. No reason yeah, not to. <laughs> no, there isn't. And uh, if you subscribe to Flying Mag, you get this for free too in the mail which is awesome. Or you can pick it up at any air show. Uh, where can they find you guys? So obviously the website or craft sale.com, but anywhere else you want to point them to? Yeah, we do uh, kind of, I do market analysis on uh, our Instagram. Uh, I think it's flying aircraft for sale. Uh, so go follow us on Instagram and I pull listings every week uh, and do kind of a, an overview of, you know, how we think the plane price is panning out. Um, because again, we took the human out of plane price, right? And that was the goal of plane price is to make it a, as objective as possible um, so that you don't have too many opinions or cooks in the kitchen defining what a value is. And so, but for social media, we can do that, right? So, um, you know, I talk about listings and uh, review the plane price and all the other details. So I would go there. You can follow us on Twitter, 
Facebook, all the things, and uh, TikTok. You know, some yeah, hilarious TikTok. TikTok memes. Yeah, yeah. Um, I cannot take credit for for most of that. It's our our wonderful social media specialist Irene. So she's great. Good doing. Well, uh, thanks for coming Let's on. Go. Thanks, thanks for having me. Come back on when we have more features. All right. Next up here, we got David Neoman, familiar name to many in the industry for sure. Um, serial airline founder, as I like to say, uh, has been on the ground floor at, at numerous airlines, uh, Azul in Brazil, uh, obviously JetBlue here in the U.S., uh, Morris Air previously quite a, quite a while ago, and now CEO and founder of Breeze Airways, uh, which is an ultra low cost startup. Um, they're based out of Utah and started in 2021 and have uh, rapidly expanded their operations across the U.S. since. So here's David. All right, David. So uh, welcome to the show. Kind of the first question I want to ask you, recent news about Breeze taking a few more uh, A220 options um, and, of course, going to an all A220 you know, non-charter fleet. Um, tell me a little bit about the decision-making process there and, and how you all came to kind of marry up to the A220. Well, we picked the A220 because it, it's an amazing aircraft. Uh, you know, it has uh, the newest technology uh, commercial airplane that there exists. It's probably 20 years newer technology than even the A320 and even more than the 737, maybe 40 years newer technology um, in, in the base um, as far as the circumference size, the window sizes, the avionics, all that kind of stuff. And what we noticed is we were flying, um, the Embraers work great for charter. And you know they um, lower utilization, but what we noticed is that about twenty five percent of the customers today, uh, at least twenty five percent, want upgraded experience, and they'll pay for it. So what we find is when someone flies this the first time or the second time or the third time, they usually upgrade their extra legroom seat or to um, what we call sand, but it's a really first class seat, and so the revenue we were getting per flight was so much more than with the two twenty. Um, even though it costs more because it's a newer airplane, it was burning less fuel, less maintenance, and had more revenue. It was just really a no-brainer to go, not only to put them all in scheduled service, but to also um, exercise some options. Um, we have we have 100, 220 total uh, firms and, and options, and so we went from 80 to 90. So we've got another 30 we can exercise, but now we're up to 90 airplanes. Gotcha. Um, you know, I, I know you talked a little bit about this during your, your press conference a couple of weeks ago, but I want to ask you about it again is to hear it uh, on here. But, you know, a lot of murmurings around, uh, you know, the, the uh, aviation blogger community about, you know, Breeze's profitability uh, and, uh, you know, kind of where that's going to be this year. You know, what do you have to kind of say to that, assuming you've read some of it? Yeah, I mean, you know, we, we had a tough go. Uh, there was no doubt about it. Uh, there was a time in our history where we had 137 captains all hired because we were just hiring captains. Uh, we had seven airplanes that we were paying for, and we were flying one airplane and 10 pilots. So obviously that makes for miserable numbers. Um, and But what you've seen as the progression of the last two and a half years, uh, you know, operating margins have been coming down, coming down, coming down uh, to the point where you know, we can, uh, we can, you know, obviously it's enormously better, um, but we're actually um, counting on making a profit this year. So uh, that's, that's a long way from where we've come even last year. Um, you know, and last year was, uh, you know, the third quarter and the fourth quarter, particularly the third quarter, were really bad for the industry. There was a lot of capacity growth. The fuel went from, 230 gallon up to 330 a gallon. So we had the spike in fuel. We had the craziness that was going on with the other airlines. Um, and so that was a kind of a scissor move that kind of <laughs> doomed the whole industry really pretty much. Um, and, and Spirit, you can see it in their numbers and, and even in the fourth quarter numbers. But, uh, you know, we, we've got that behind us. And we, we've, you know, we're, we, we, the other thing we had is we, because we didn't get the pilots qualified uh, kind of in 22 and 23, we had enormous growth. 
And so there was a lot of markets that were maturing. And you know, now we've got a s- smaller percent that, that are that are new. And so, you know, the revenue is really coming in and the costs are getting really a lot better. You know, when you start a business, the, your costs are at all time high and your revenues are all time low. And then, you know, those two, two things converge and that's where you make profit. And then after that, it's just kind of off to the races. So we feel really good about our positioning. Got you. I, I want to, you kind of prompted another question here about, you know, the whole theory in the low cost market of cost convergence and kind of the changes these days. You know, you hear a lot about it on different airlines earnings calls, you know, oh, low cost model. Uh, you know, especially the ultra low cost model is is doing super, super great. Uh, you know, what do you kind of say to that? Do you think that's valid concern or do you think, you know, maybe some of the, some of these mentioned companies aren't quite set up, you know, uh, uh, to weather these, these, uh, these waves? I think, I think it's a valid criticism in, in certain aspects. Um, you know, that I'll just give you two numbers. We've got about 90% of our routes where we have no non-stop competition. And, you know, Spirit, for example, at last time I saw were 80% where they had overlap. So, you know, if um, times get tough or fuel goes up or fares come down or whatever, it's a much better position to be in where you have no competitive markets or very few competitive markets. Uh, Azul, I learned that lesson at Azul. Azul's got 80% of its markets where we're all by ourselves in Brazil. And we just do, we out, we outperform, uh, you know, every other airline and have in 14 years have become the largest airline in Brazil just because we, you know, did a different strategy. Um, so, um, uh, speaking of routes, onlookers, you know, what should we expect to see in terms of Breeze's route strategy here in 2024? Is there anything sort of on the horizon that you might be able to talk about? Well, we're announcing them just about every day, it seems like. Uh, yes, uh, it does. <laughs> We knocked Manchester this week as our first fifty first city. And you know, we're just being opportunistic. You know, we you know, one of the things that that I didn't mention about, you know, a comparison maybe with with us and the ULCCs, you know, there's a few things that are different. Number one, we you know, we're usually alone in our markets. Number two, um, we have a, a premium um section of the airplane that makes sense and that and and it, it costs us less because of the two and three seating. When we go first class, we only lose one seat per row as opposed to double that amount. Um, if you're on a, you know, a, a seven thirty seven or an A three twenty, you know those 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 two things. Uh, but then it's the airplane size. You know, I think these guys um, all thought, let's wow, if we can just get lower and lower and lower chasms, uh, cost per available seat mile. And we can do that by just putting more and more seats in the airplane. We're going to a bigger and bigger airplane. Then you know we can always win. Um, you know the challenge is is that when the the big guys, the majors, they started going with bigger and bigger airplanes, and they looked at their incremental size of an airplane between a three twenty and a three twenty one, or max eight, or a max out in X seven, but seven thirty seven seven hundred or 800 up to a max nine, they took those incremental seats and say, I get these seats cheaper than a ULCC does. So I'm just going to match them on those. And they created a special class of, uh, of service for that. So, you know, the, you know, I, I love our trip cost advantage, right? I, I would get, I, I would guess we're probably somewhere between 15 and 20% lower trip costs with a premium seating section being all loan in the market. And, and that really is, you know, our, our advantage. Um, and if you, what, if you have a 20% lower trip cost, that means that if, you know, I need 110 seats on an airplane and they need a hundred that, you know, at 110 seats on an airplane, we're both flying 110. That means I'm, I can be making a 20% margin. They can be breaking even, or I can be making 10%. They're losing 10%. So that trip cost advantage is is really big, and I, I that was a big lesson I also learned. So, uh, you talk about sort of trip cost advantage and all that, and kind of always brings up the point nowadays of of pilots and you know new contracts that have come up that are you know pretty lucrative for for certainly the pilots. Um, do you 
you know, do you kind of see this pilot shortage getting better, improving right now that everybody talks about? Oh, much better. It's it's night and day. Um, the difference of a year makes. Um, Southwest just announced they've already hired pilots for their April class, but they said from April on they're not hiring a single pilot the rest of the year. Um, you know, Sp- Spirit's got about seven hundred pilots too much too many. Um, you, you you've got um, FedEx that has too many pilots. Uh, the hiring slowing down. Delta said they're going to hire half as many pilots this year as they were last year. So it's really nine day difference. And I knew it would be because, you know, numbers are numbers. And, you know, there were about 7,000 pilots that were early retired during COVID. They kind of took a little bit of that, took some of that um, money that they got from the government and said, hey, how about if you guys retire early? So you had to backfill for those 7,000 plus all the people that were going to get to be 65, um, you know, in the last three years. So probably 12,000 pilots though, they had to be filled. But uh, yeah, I think we're, everybody's getting caught up now. And so we literally have hundreds and hundreds of pilot applications now. So we're in good shape. So David, real quick, um, I wanted to ask about your guys' Embark pilot program. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that and uh, the schools you're partnering with for that? And is this kind of just to, you know, maintain a pipeline of pilots going into Breeze? Yeah, I and mean, I can give you the specific examples of the schools. And, you know, we have a lot of them that we have relationships with. Um, you know, we've been focusing a little bit more honestly on more experienced first officers because once you, we want you to upgrade to be captain. And everybody wants to do that because you make twice as much money just about. Um, And so, you know, we've been focusing, because we have so many pilot applications, you know, we can really focus on on the first officers that have more hours so they can upgrade quicker for us. But, uh, you know, it's something that will come in waves. You know, today we're not really focused on, on, on getting pilots out of training because we have so many applications, but that time will come again for sure. That makes sense. Yeah. So you guys are basically hiring first officers with 121 experience already in their books? Yeah. Yeah. If we can, as much as we can. Yeah. You know, not not, not someone who's just got their 1500 hours. Uh, The regionals are doing most mostly that, but uh, we do hire some of those and, you know, we were, we like them and, and they are well qualified. I can think of a few that are doing great for us. Um, but when they come on, they have to fly another thousand hours before they can even qualify to become a first op- a captain and probably 1500 hours. Cause they need like 3000 hours in a large, larger transport, uh, airplane to be a, a, a so, captain. So, you know, I, we talk about pilots, it's, it's always the flavor of the mod. You got an earnings call, it's all about the pilots. But I think it always strikes me is like, you know, airline executive, do you, do you find struggles in other work groups with retention and attrition and that sort of thing right now that that uh, may be overshadowed by all the uh, the pilot stuff? Not really. Um, you know, I, I think the airports were challenged for a while, um, and you know, getting getting people hired right after COVID, I, I haven't you know we haven't had too many problems with that. We are making a concerted effort this year to to insource uh, at least above the wing. We call it. So our customer service contact positions to to be in. So we've targeted three or four of our of our bigger cities to do that. I'd like to you know do more of that. You know, flight attendant attrition is I'd, it it varies based on basis, but we're doing some things there. I think are pretty cool. Um, you know, we're gonna we're gonna be um, offering more part time so people can do it as a, a part time job where if two people can share a line. And fly together and you divide it up and then you can you know if you're a mother or if you have other responsibilities in life you can still have that the thrill of being a flight attendant but also you know not not have it completely consume your whole life that's pretty cool it's pretty cool um so i, I did want to also touch base to it we were talking a little bit about route structure a little earlier do you see kind of a an international uh presence for breeze here coming soon perhaps i sure hope so um it take you know we have to go through the same process that we did when we certified so we're doing was we to get what's called flag status um so we hope to be able to do international charters here pretty soon and then the next step is 
over the next four to six months will be flag status. And there's a lot of international destinations we'd love to fly to. Got you. Um, so I, I also kind of wanted to touch to kind of my final question here is, you know, you've founded several different airlines. You've been on the ground floor several. Uh, you know, what do you say to somebody that uh, might be interested in looking at starting an airline? <laughs> or oh, we'll yeah. get a lot of money. Yeah. Get some serious money together. And uh, unless it's a small operation that you find a little niche that you can that you can do and yeah, you know, if you've got to pretty well be under because of the pilot costs where they are today, you've got to be under thirty seats or even nine seats, depending on how you interpret the law. You know, that there's a lot of that area today. Um, you know, just Find a niche and and uh, exploit it, and you know our, our people are really good at doing that. I'm really pleased with how things are going. Yeah, well, uh, you know, there's certainly a, maybe a niche during COVID that Breeze and some others found, but do you see a, a niche now that that still exists here in the U.S.? Do you think the market's too saturated? Oh yeah. Now we we've got at least another thousand routes that we've identified that we can fly in. So we're only up to 170, and then by the time we get to a thousand, we'll find another thousand. Yeah, you guys need more Denver routes, They're just selfishly. I know you have that new Rhode Island one. Yeah. But yeah. Are you in Denver? Yeah, we're starting yeah. Providence. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's going to be a good route for us this summer. We'll see how it does. But it's more of a seasonal route. But, you know, it's uh, – yeah. Rhode Island's amazing. You know, it's in yeah. the summertime with Newport, lobsters and all that kind of oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. Get those inland to the coast. Yeah, well, well I'll try it out. All right, so Ryan, when you think of Flighting Media Group, do you think of cheap, unscripted bedroom videos? Because apparently that's a perfect description of this series, and it's not journalism. And I noticed Ooh. you changed your background. Was it because of these comments? Uh, yeah, you know, take a stab at a new background here. You got one of my favorite books. This is not a plug, I promise. Hard Landings, uh, and, you know, customary copy of our our. Uh, magazine behind me so yeah i am trying to background and for the record this is my office in my house this is not <laughs> a bedroom now i don't know about yours but this is not this a, is a guest bedroom this is a straight up guest bedroom so they're they're kind of accurate on it um so another piece of feedback we got was this is not washable by anyone over 40 o ominous view <laughs> of the gen z world to come in my humble opinion all right first up I am um, deep millennial. I am 30, dude. I'm not a Gen yeah, Z you're old, TikToker. Man. Yeah, they would not like want to see what a Gen Z podcast would look so, like. It would just be I like... Just wanna, I just want to state this for the record. Make anybody who watches us feel better that you know we're not just a bunch of crazy Gen Zers or millennials. I don't know what I am. So I'm somewhere in between Gen Z and millennial. Um, but I had to ask one of our interns, college-aged interns, <laughs> how to make a TikTok. All right? I don't know how to do that stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> so if it makes anybody feel better, I literally had to call Irene, one of our greatest interns, um, to help me make a TikTok. So, you know, there's you that. You couldn't even you couldn't even delete a post the other day. So, well, that was funny. because that that was because uh, you know I think you you were on an airplane. So yeah, see, we fly. So I'm gonna um, blame it on you. Yeah. No, I think like yeah, the overall thing here is like I I think the feedback's good and it's sometimes funny and I don't know if it's serious at times and I think some of these are, <laughs> but uh, no, we're trying to just like you know not talk about what we don't know and fill those gaps in with professionals like we have been and try to present these topics in a you know different way. Well, and, might. and look, and you know, a lot of people ask in the comments, you know, where's Paul Bernelli? Um. Paul retired. He's retired. He retired. <laughs> He's he retired. <laughs> uh, Paul's great. I, as much as the next guy, will go out and watch Paul Bernelli uh, video any day. Actually, I remember in college, uh, in a class that I took for my uh, aviation management program, um, in our private pilot ground school, my first class ever in college, Paul Bernelli's videos were being shown. So he really is one of the best. And, you know, we want to carry on that legacy as best as we can. Um, but 
you know, it might be a little different format uh, so we can appeal to a broader audience. And I think we'll have Paul on here eventually. We're just we just got to get him out of his motorcycle riding retirement because yep. he's enjoying it too much. Anyways, hopefully we'll catch you next week. See ya. <laughs>